Good day to you, Guyana. Welcome to Facing the Nation. I know some of you are probably disappointed because uh, you were just um, viewing some updates regarding Ebola. And of course, as you know, the mayor of uh, New York City is about to make a statement on that. And the reason I'm following up from what was uh, being aired before I came on is because we are talking about Ebola today. That's exactly what a partnership for national unity is focusing on. I know many of you are concerned, especially since last night's development, because um, from the international media, you heard that uh, someone in New York City was discovered, a doctor actually was discovered, um, he was diagnosed, I think tested and diagnosed with Ebola. And many of Guyanese, many of us, we have relatives and friends living in that area in New York City and we're very concerned. But not only are we concerned for them, we're concerned for Guyana. Because as you know, our health state is far, our health sector is far from being um, the best. It's, it's far from being even satisfactory. So our concern in a partnership for national unity is that the government of Ghana has not done enough to protect our citizens in the event that someone here is to be diagnosed with Ebola. We don't want it to happen. We're not praying for it to happen and uh, we're running from it. But at the end of the day, the older folks always said that prevention is better than cure, and we cannot wait until something happen or, or happens, or until it's one of in, in our one of our neighboring countries before we decide to do something about it. So today, a partnership for national unity is expressing concern and at the same time calling on the government to have a national strategic plan to deal with Ebola. On today's program, you'll hear from the two doctors who are um, going to tell you today that it's not just about saying that we are. Uh, training a certain amount of workers to handle the case of Ebola but apart from that just being there for the camera and the lights we are not seeing anything being done by government to protect this country from Ebola and to put us in a position that if we were to get an outbreak we are, we'll be able to deal with that patient or with those patients. With me I first introduce to you Dr. Karen Cummings. We're also expecting Dr. Norton but for now uh, Dr. Karen Cummings is here. Of course as you know she's an APNU member of parliament, she's a medical doctor and she assists uh, Dr. Norton, Dr. George Norton in the health field regarding the works of a partnership for national unity. Welcome, Dr. Cummings. Thank you. Lisa. All right. Great to have you. Uh, before we get further into today's program, I have two clips for you. I'll show you those clips, and then when we come back, hopefully Dr. Norton is here by then, and we'll talk about Ebola, we'll talk about what Guyana needs to be doing at this point in time to protect our citizens. You are viewing a clip there about the Ebola virus and just to remind you and to put today's discussion into context, um, I'm just going to read the first few sentences of what Partnership for National Unity wants. Uh, APNU calls for a national plan to respond to the Ebola virus disease. A Partnership for National Unity calls for the immediate promulgation of a national plan of action to respond to the threat of entry of the Ebola virus, that's the EVD into Guyana. EVD, of course, is the another medical term for it. So far, I have Dr. Karen Cummings with me. Dr. Cummings, just to open uh, today's discussion. You, as a doctor, in terms, and I'm, I'm going to use here, here I'm going to use chicken gunia as an example. We, our country, our nation went into an uproar regarding what happened with chicken gunia because it seems that we couldn't get that under on, on control. We still, uh, can't seem to get it on to under control because people are still coming up every day um, and, and falling ill as a result of chikungunya. From what you were seeing, if we couldn't handle chikungunya, how equipped or how prepared are we to handle a possible outbreak of Ebola here? I think, um, Malaika, you have gotten it correctly. I mean, definitely if we can't handle chikungunya, mm -hmm. it's very uh, it kind of far-fetched for us to handle a serious threat public health crisis like a developing country like ours mm. for Ebola. I think we are, I don't know how prepared we are, we're making efforts, a lot of rhetoric, but I have reasons to suspect that we may not be able to handle such a, a case. Mm. Um, we have to, our protection, our prevention, our surveillance needs much more to be desired. 
Um, our ports of entry, as you know, we are bordering with Suriname, Brazil, Venezuela. I'm not too sure what's happening there. We may have personnel there. I don't know how equipped they are in terms of screening, entry, and exit. Um, in terms of our community engagement and social mobilization, um, getting the community in involved. We can't even get off local government elections whereby we can empower the people to be part and process of participate, you know, social participation. That's not being done. In terms of our coordination and control, I know we have agencies like PAHO, Centers of Disease for Disease Control, they will be doing, but we need some update on where we are, where hmm. we're going, you know, some kind of direction. So I think, um, you know, in terms of clinical preparedness and case management, also, I'm not too sure um, what has been the, uh, we, are, we are training um, healthcare workers, mm -hmm. even though some persons say we don't have enough um, equipment to train everybody because the suit, we're not sure if we have adequate suits, people are maybe just recycling the suits in terms of practicing, <laughs> you know, but we have a lot more to be done. Um, it's doable, but it has to be intersectoral cooperation, you know. Um, APNU, we are willing to come on board with the PPPC and, you know, other stakeholders there. So we, because this is it's not APNU thing or so, it's a Guyanese thing. Mm -hmm. And so we are all part of the Guyanese. And so um, we will be able to put our heart and hands together in, in bringing this thing to a halt if it does come here. All right. Let, let me touch on the suits. <laughs> Uh, the suit that we see, of course, um, viewers at home, you would know that it's a, uh, your ent entire body has yes. to be protected, especially yes. if you're a doctor, if you're a medical personnel, uh, dealing with a person who would have been um, diagnosed or in unfortunately even dying as a result of um, the Ebola virus. You're saying that um, you've gotten information that we may not even have enough uh, for training. Yes. First off, are these suits, are they manufactured here as far as you know? Are they, are they manufactured, manufactured here? Can, can they be, I should say? I, I'm, I am not sure, but I know it's because I think it's overseas. I think mm -hmm. it's overseas. I'm not sure if we make it here. Uh, Dr. Norton has just arrived. I'm not sure yes. if the suits are from Guyana. Okay. I think we import Dr. Those Norton, suits. welcome. Uh, you came at an, uh, an opportune <laughs> time. We're talking about the suits um, that we see. Uh, uh, we are seeing it on the international media, and I think we saw a couple here that they're using to train personnel. And, and of course, it wouldn't only be the suits to train, but that would be the suits to use in the event that we have to deal with the Ebola cases here. Are they manufactured here, or can they be manufactured here? They're not manufactured here. I don't think they can be manufactured here. Okay. They have to be brought in from outside. All right. Dr. Martin, I'd like, I'd like to get a statement from you. Of course, we heard from Dr. Cummins, a general statement. What are your thoughts on where Guyana is regarding preparation for Ebola? As I said, and I keep reassuring viewers, um, so far there hasn't been any cases of Ebola here, or according to what we've read and what we're hearing, uh, or any neighboring country, one of our neighboring countries, with uh, any case of Ebola. But Dr. Norton, in the event that it happens, where are we in terms of preparedness? Well, first of all, you know, this Ebola virus disease is, can best be described as an acute public health crisis mm -hmm. of international concern. I say that because while the disease per se might be concentrated in West Africa, in some of the countries in West Africa, mm -hmm. It is of such a nature that everybody has to be concerned, including there. And uh, pre-Ebola, uh, that is, let's say, early this year, to where we are now, that we have Ebola even in New York, there hasn't been much difference in terms of our status of readiness or preparedness to uh, control this disease. Should we be seeking international assistance for f financially, financial international assistance? Because if we're saying that, look, these suits, um, they're not manufactured here. Uh, we've read, most of us have read that, look, uh, you cannot or you should not bury an e Ebola patient who would unfortunately die. You shouldn't bury them the same way you would bury a normal person. We're talking about airports in terms of quarantine facility. This is a lot. So should we be reaching out internationally for funds and equipment to deal with this? Certainly, there's no doubt about that. It is of such a nature that um, 
Ghana alone cannot. I mean, while I agree, yes, that Jamaica could have put 400 million to the preparation or uh, trying to prevent it from getting to Jamaica, um, other countries have openly asked, I think it's Antigua who asked Canada for assistance. Um, I don't think Ghana would be out of place to ask directly for help. Um, in spite of the fact that um, we have seen money being spent to, to from uh, some certain point of view that might not be in a priority in terms of, of the healthcare situation in Guyana, yet I don't think our economy would prepare us for b uh, enough. I mean, we, we, don't, we don't have a, 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 an economy that would m prepare us to prevent this Ebola virus from coming to Guyana and creating havoc. Before I come back to Dr. Cummins, why have we yet not asked, um, why have we not yet reached out internationally for funds to help us to deal with this? Because this is a serious issue. The, the thing about Guyana is quite unlike at least what we've been seeing in the newspapers, um, news from Trinidad, news from Grenada, news from Antigua, news from Jamaica, we're seeing CNN, Al Jazeera, um, we've seen BBC, everybody talking about Ebola. We are not getting that kind of, let's say, report or regular feedback. We're having contradictions, you know, a half information coming from the Minister of Foreign Affairs, another coming from the Minister of Health, one coming from the, um, the Presidential Secretariat that, uh, that are not meshing with each other. So what we have is a lack of information a lack of coordination, a coordinated effort. So we don't know exactly where we stand. Is the Ministry of Health underestimating this disease? I don't think any, any min ministry, any country would under underestimate it. But for some reason or the other, like we've been having in the chikungunya situation, like we had in the gastroenteritis um, crisis that we had in Port Kaituma, we are not getting the information that, as the public, uh, that we need. And of course, the excuse we were given in times before were that um, we don't want to create a crisis, we don't want to create unnecessary alarm, we don't want to prevent the tourists from coming, we don't want to prevent the investors from coming, or we have it under, con under control, so there's no need for that. That is what we've been getting in the gastroenteritis situation, in the Ebola situation. I don't know if that is the policy, if that's the strategy, if that's the way the Ministry of Health think that they would they would go about the Ebola thing, but certainly it's not working. All right, Dr. Norton. Dr. Cummins, I want to talk about um, symptoms and uh, possible ways in which, because of course, the viewers, as you know, it, there is no known vaccine or cure for it. It's, it's been said that uh, they're working on a uh, vaccine that hopefully would be available before the end of the year. Of course, I'm going to come back to Dr. Norton and talk about that in a bit. But Dr. Cummins, what, what should you look for? And while we're waiting on government, or our, our wonderful government, quote unquote wonderful uh, government to come up with a national uh, plan, what should the, how should people try to protect themselves in the event that it just turns up here overnight? Okay, um, Malika, mm -hmm. I think well, you've gone ahead to prevention and treatment actually, mm -hmm. but because t we, we are working on, since there's no cure, we have to focus on prevention, mm -hmm. all right? so. We have to be very meticulous with our hygiene, you know, in terms of we touching surface areas, the way, we, as you mentioned before, we handle our dead, because if a person's Ebola, there's a particular way you have to handle the dead, less, you know, it, it makes matters worse. And the person who's handled the dead become exposed. Um, the healthcare workers, you have to make sure the person who is, uh, has the disease, you keep with, apart, from, uh, you're supposed to be away from one meter away from the person. All right, because if, within, if you're within one meter, the chances are that you will catch the Ebola. Um, but some of the symptoms, as you mentioned before, are constitutional symptoms like diarrhea, um, fever above 101 degrees Fahrenheit, chills, anorexia, malaise, um, sore throat, diarrhea, 
vomiting, headaches, those are early symptoms, but if you continue without being treated, you can actually come down with late symptoms like liver failure and kidney failure. Okay, if I can jump in here, just uh, to be clear, is it that if you, especially if it's in the early stages, is it that you are, if you catch the virus, if you get Ebola, you are going to die? Is that definite? If you seek early treatment, no, because you may need to be rehydrated, and of course, you, you, we treat the symptoms, but the, the main thing here of priority is the hygiene, right? Okay. Because remember, this thing is in semen, it's in your body fluids. And so you have to prevent, that's we have to stay clear of this from the other person, the person who's infected. So it's basically hygiene. I would say number one is hygiene. Pre and preventing, meaning contact with, of course, the, well, animal, we don't have <laughs> fruit bat here. I'm not sure if we have fruit bat here. But gorillas and monkeys and chimpanzees. But, you know, we stay clear from the animals. And if you're going to use the meat, people like the bush meat. And so you want to make sure the meat is cooked thoroughly, mm -hmm. you know, properly and thorough. And so, um, so you have to contain the animal and direct to direct transmission. And, of course, if you have, like, the lab, laboratory technicians and you know the persons who were from the funeral homes you have to make sure that it's contained and those persons are quarantined so they won't spread it all right um, just so just to make it clear we saw uh, before even before our uh, facing the nation program came on we were watching international news and we saw that one of the, the, the they're in they're reporting that one of the nurses who uh, got Ebola a few weeks ago she's been, she's Ebola free now and she's cured just so the viewers understand what would they have done, especially since we don't have a vaccination vaccine for it, what would they have done to cure her? Is it if you have a sore throat, you treat for sore throat. If you have a fever, you treat for fever. Well, in addition to that, treating symptomatically. But in the case of the nurse, if I'm going to go back there, sure. the, the gong, the way how you fit your, we call it personal protective equipment, the mm -hmm. way how you fit the gong from head to toe should not be exposed, your gloves, your mask and everything. So, but what is happening that we have to be very, very careful, not only putting it on, but taking it off. Mm -hmm. Because I think in the, the case of the nurse, when she was taking it off, and she probably just put her hands in the nose and, and she, and she got, you know, got it. It's that simple. It's that simple. So um, I think steps were taken by Centers for Disease Control that you'll have somebody who's going to monitor the way you, you've actually taken off your gong. So, so that's one way we have to ensure that the person you know, puts it on correctly and takes it off correctly. And of course, as I said before, make sure hand washing technique and basically hygiene in, in terms of prevention. All right. Dr. Norton. Uh, I, I know you, you're anxious to come in here, but even before we come back to Guyana's case, a few persons were having a discussion, and the question came up, why in the first place did, uh, whether it be the WHO or the CDC, not have that, if it was possible, that entire uh, continent where the, the outbreak occurred, why not have it closed off at least for 21 days for the incubation period? and to prevent it from spreading to other continents because in the initial, initial stages, they say it may not uh, reach spread to other continents, but now we're seeing a different story. Can you talk well, about Actually, you know, this is not the first outbreak. Hmm. As I said, it happened since in 1976. Hmm. Um, at a, at a, um, not such a large scale, but at one stage, um, they got it under control because they closed off particular area, they quarantined a particular area. I remember um, the president with the Minister of Health of that country deciding that no rail, no, no motor vehicle travel, no air, and they managed to get things under control then. What happened now is you had um, outbreaks taking place in more than one area, and it spread like wildfire then it might have been easier especially under the regime that was there that existed in the country at that time uh the president could have you know uh forcefully imposed quarantine that might not be so easily readily done now and so it's difficult but um the the if if situation um reach a certain level then we won't have a choice but to do something like and the rest of maybe sure. more you were able to quarantine better maybe in a rural area, but in urban and these areas, you know, we have a yeah, lot of movements. Of traffic yes, movement. maybe a little different. A little no, but difficult. the case I'm referring to, it involved the capital. Mm. It involved the capital. And they were able to quarantine they the entire capital. And they got it under control. Mm -hmm. Of course they do. What was, what remained constant in that all these outbreaks, the, 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 the fatality is roughly 50%, sometimes more than 50%. In other words, if 
500 persons are infected, 250 is going. And that's where we stand today. In seven countries, we've got about 10,000 persons infected, 500 is gone. 5,000 5, has gone already. And that's just, that, that's the whole, whole. And then um, does your existing immune system have a lot to do with it on whether your immune system is strong or weak or, or that doesn't matter, period? That always matter, always matter. Even, even to the chicken gunya, it matters. Um, and you might find because of that, uh, the, the, the treatment or let's say the case management has a lot to do with that. The, the rehydration, you know, you have to um, have that patient well hydrated. Um, sometimes, uh, like, uh, in you might have a low um, white blood sugar count, low platelets. Sometimes you might have to transfuse patients and they produce in different um, di di different substances in order to to improve the immune system and so on. Okay. All right. Viewers, if you're now joining us, we're talking um, Ebola and the fact that Guyana needs to do much, much more. Actually, we haven't started doing anything as yet, aside from um, statements coming from uh, various persons like both Dr. Karen Cummings and Dr. George Norton said earlier about what they're doing, what they're hoping to do, and we haven't seen anything yet. We haven't even seen or heard about monies being put aside. Of course, we're going to talk to Dr. Norton about that. And I am going to try my best to open up the phone lines because I know this is your health we're dealing with. You may have some questions that I haven't even thought about, you know. So I'll open up the phone lines for you to pose your questions to both doctors. Of course, we're talking about e Ebola, even chikungunya, and anything that has to do with the health sector. You can pose those questions today. But any other matter, any other subject, I'm not going to take those questions uh, today. Dr. Norton, let's imaginary, I'm going to call it, imaginary fast for and say government wakes up from his, its slumber and decide to uh, have a national plan to deal with this, get money, to so get an international assistance. Let's say they do all of that and we just, uh, God forbid viewers, we happen to have a case, get a case of uh, Ebola here. How easy or how difficult would it be to quarantine an entire community in Guyana? Oh, a, a, a city again, God forbid. How easy it would, would be for us to do that here? What I admire about Jamaica is that they got the Jamaica Defense Force as early as possible involved. I mean, it's that serious. Hats off to, to, to uh, Miss Simpson. You know, she ma managed to get the, 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 the soldiers involved, and that's the way we've got to go about doing this thing. We've got to get the Guyana Defense Force involved if we need to quarantine any area and that e even under those conditions it's going to be really difficult because let us not forget that it started from the animal to human beings meaning the fruit bats we have bats in Ghana thousands of bats different types of bats we don't know how uh, how bats migrate if a bat we know we know swallows for instance from travel from the north pole to the south pole what if you have a, such a species of bat that, that can cross that atlantic and come from west africa over to to, to Suriname? are you saying to, um, to, 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 to brazil are you saying dr norton just for clarity that we should not only be concerned that a person may bring it in through one of our ports but we should concern that a, a a bat, I mean, as there is a, since there is a breakout, that we should concern a bat or a, a monkey or, or could bring it as it is now? Th that is the point. We're not doing enough. We've got to let the people in the interior know how serious this thing is. You know, we're here and we're on television and somebody said to us, what else are you doing to the other parts of the, of, but we've got to know that it comes from animal to human. And while it, the fruit bat might be the most popular, all the animals could come in contact, contact with the fruit bats because when the fruit bats eat the fruit and the fruit drops, the animals below the, uh, below the tree now eat the fruit. You understand? And that's how the porcupine and the different things. Guyana, the indigenous people in Guyana or the people in the interior locations or who work there use wild meat as uh, probably, you know, a, a main course of, of their meal. Like what would happen in, in those West African countries. Okay, are we educating the people enough to let them know this? Are we saying to the indigenous people that 
let us be careful, let us make certain that you do an extra bit of, of boiling or cooking, you know, um, rather than just, you know, um, the regular thing. Because it can happen, it can happen, that's how it travels. And then from, from the animal, from the ma animal to the human being, then that's it, human being to human being, and one whole big door is open. So while we're worried about people coming from <laughs> New York City with it, we can be creating our own monster here, beginning in the interior locations. Mm -hmm. Definitely, yeah. definitely, we can do it. That can happen. We've got to look at this thing holistically, all over. And that is why it is so important that education, we can never stop emphasizing and uh, disseminating all the information about uh, the Ebola virus. Not only through, through the, uh, the, the, the airports. In the United States of America, they, they, they had stopped, they, had, they used five airports that they, they, they stopped people from coming. It ended up in New York. If, you then, if it ends up in New York, then it's all over. Yes, because it's all over. everyone, it's all over. And every nation lives there. It didn't only really end up in New and it didn't end up in New York. And I want to say this because, you know, while we might be guilty of sensationalization, sens that is, we're talking about this thing too often or too much, we've got to be practical. You can't be telling the nation that, oh, it's it's an intelligent person because it's a doctor and he <laughs> would have been self um, he, he testing himself to, you know taking his temperature and so on that's why he could go bowling in an alley and and traveling in, in subways and so on the, it is it is much more dangerous than that so we have to do everything that is possible everything that is possible Ghana is less than 800,000 we can be decimated if this thing happens. We are in a, a situation that would best be described as an emergency of an international flavor. Should, again, again, I'm, I'm, I'm going to come back to Dr. Cummins because I want to know what she thinks about in, in terms of um, people's mindset regarding this. Because, of course, I know you operate a clinic daily, so you see people every day. Should there have been, uh, and, and Dr. Cumming, Dr. Norton, again, I, I'm confused and I'm sure the public is confused. When we talk about first world countries like America, we're thinking that they have the best of everything, especially in terms of medical equipment. And I'm wondering at this point in time, why wasn't there some sort of mechanism put in place whereby doctors returning from West Africa who would have gone there specifically to treat uh, Ebola patients, why wasn't there some sort of mechanism in place to monitor every doctor coming back from there? Because I'm thinking, if America didn't think about it, what about us here in Guyana? The point is, we're taking too much for granted. You know, Cuba has sent over 200 persons to work there, and they're planning on sending more. I doubt if that would ever happen to the Cubans who are returning. They're they that careful? Are, uh, they're that careful because persons, you know, are conscious of, of the consequences and, uh, and would take the necessary measures, you okay. know. And as I said before, hats off to them. They're leading by example, but they've got the experience. And I have been in Cuba where schools were quarantined because of conjunctivitis, red eyes, and nobody couldn't leave nor enter that school because you had an outbreak of conjunctivitis. You know, it, and they take it that serious. So you need to treat something, uh, you know, you know uh, uh, something like Ebola that has got that mortality rate much more serious than that. All right. Dr. Cummins, what are you hearing from our people? O are our people indeed panicking, or are they just going about their daily routine as though, you know, this Ebola is not serious, it can't come here? What's happening? I think they're very much aware by reading the newspapers, by um, listening to the television, CB BBC, and so on. And so they're beginning to understand, you know, the seriousness of the disease, you know, the whole public health crisis, you know, needs to be averted. But um, I think, okay, let me ask, answer your question directly. I know at my clinic, um, 
Even the chicken, people are still coming in with chicken guni up to now, you know. They're still coming in with chicken guni. So it's not contained as we're it's being not, told? That's not contained at all. It's not contained. People coming in with rash, you know, joint pains, they continue. And and I think that um, people are hoping and praying that they come to some halt to this disease because if Guyana, with our current state, will be wiped up in no time. So um, my advice is that we should really um, improve and um what must I say, in terms of our public awareness, we have to step up, you know, on our public health awareness, um, the televisions, the um, IEC material information, education and communication. As Doctor alluded to earlier, we don't want mixed signals coming even from the government. You know, if they need to have, like if it's one person who is the, the contact person who's going to make the statement on their behalf, and so they will put their thoughts together, and, you know, it's coming from one particular person, and you know what, you know, what their plans are. You know, right now it's mixed signals. We don't know what's, what's happening. We're in you know, no updates and so on. So I would hope that by, as in yesterday, we'll have some more ads coming on the televisions. We'll have some more posters, you know, billboards, and, you know, you know something on the not only the 10,000 voucher in terms of the <laughs> children, but you know, you know, more serious information on the on the billboards. Because of course, mm. if Ebola hits us, we won't be able to do anything with the 10,000. Yeah, right, better huh? believe it. That's right. Okay. That's right. But just to sure. support what Dr. Cummins was saying, if we in Ghana could open our newspaper and here it is, Dr. Khan from the Minister of Health from Trinidad saying the door is now open. Nigeria is cleared of Ebola, they can come. Mm -hmm. Okay? That is from a country who know exactly what the situation is and they can make such a, they can make such a bold statement. That that, that speaks up, you know, oh, yes. so much about the efficiency of their system and their concern. But I, I'm happy that you raised that point, um, Dr. Norton, because uh, two weeks ago we had, and it looked really, really bad. I would like to know what your thoughts on this are. We had one day Minister of Health, Dr. Bear Ramsaran, saying, um, and we saw the big, the big headlines um, via social media, of course, that look, we don't necessarily need to close our borders. There's no need for us to do that. And then within a space of hours, less than 24 hours, we saw, because I even had relatives and friends who, are, who called and asked, what is wrong with our Minister of Health? Within a space of hours, then he comes back and there's another headline news. Well, Guyana has decided, we have joined with uh, some of the other Caribbean countries and we, we decided to close our borders from people coming from um, those continents, th that continent, those areas where there was the Ebola outbreak. What does this sort of confusion really say about the state of our, not even the health sector, I'm going to go directly to the health minister. What does it say about his state in terms of being able to keep our nation healthy? Certainly he's not prepared for what we are experiencing now. But I'm not surprised. It happened before. We had a situation where we had we heard of Paho WHO saying something about our suicide rate. Mm. No word from him, but we heard it being disputed by somebody else from the presidential uh, from the office of the president that that information is not is not necessarily true. You know, so somewhere along we get we're getting the impression that, that he's totally. Um, not to fear or, 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 or not up to date with what is taking place. Should a president step in now and, and give some sort of directive? The president should have stepped in a long time ago. Saying that he would call upon the members of the other parties for us to prevent this Ebola virus here in Guyana is not good enough. He's got to call us on board. We make a statement that APNU is prepared to work with the government and any civil organization at any time to help to prevent this Ebola virus from reaching Guyana and to do anything to, to improve the, the defense system that we have against that infection. All right. But there, there's, there's, some, there's some areas that we've got to look at. We've got to look at Gadgets, I would say, simple gadgets. That thermometer that measures the temperature of every person who passes through that airport, 
was already acquired by, by Antigua. I don't think we, we have We don't any. have any we here? Don't, I don't think we have any. Somebody was saying that you had to play play storm. I meant to manually under the arms of person. Uh, is, that, is that the situation that we have there? You know, what is the level of our port health, port health authority personnel? What are they medics? I don't think they're medics. They're nurses. I don't think they're staff nurses. What is their level of qualification? You know, what do they do? We have a problem. We need to get this, this, this thing in order. Dr. Norton, if I may come back to the term moments and the under the arm thing, I think that will be making the situation worse if someone really and truly has Ebola and you, I mean, unless you clean it properly. But still, if I am going in or coming out at this time and you want to test my temperature and you're going to ask to put a thermometer under my arm or wherever, I'm going to refuse because I don't know where that thermometer has been. How do we deal with that? Unless you have a laser thermometer, that is the only other option. I'm not saying that that is being done, done. or that was okay. done, but unless you have that laser thermometer, that's the only way. And, and it's as simple. You don't even know persons are taking your body temperature. All you do is walk. All you do is walk past. Can't we yeah. afford to have a few of these? I we probably might have to cut back on, on the, 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 the Marriott or the grant money for Prob the probably okay probably. all right um uh, viewers i'm going to open the phone lines in a bit um dr cummings i want to talk a bit about nutrition because again while we're waiting on government to decide if it wants guiana to have uh, an ebola outbreak or not um People are going to want to know, w apart from the sanitization, which we talked about already, washing hands, trying to um, minimize the, the risk. human and, and, and minim minimize the risk. What should people be doing now in terms of health and nutrition? What should we be eating? What should we not eat? I'm not saying, viewers, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that these things are going to help you to not get it. Mm -hmm. But, you know, what should we, how should we be taking care of our mm -hmm. bodies now? Well, in addition to what you've said in terms of the meticulous hygiene, mm -hmm. we need to um, build our immune system, as was mentioned earlier. So we have to make sure we're fluids, we're just in the tropics, and so we have to ensure that we are well hydrated, drink adequate water, um, a lot of fruits, our vegetables, our grains, our nuts. I'm tempted to say be vegetarian. <laughs> No, <laughs> I'm tempted to be vegetarian, but I know people like their meat. But if you're going to use the bush meat, make sure it's cooked properly. The heat kills the, yes, the virus. Yes, yeah, make sure it, it's it's cooked properly. But to, to be safe, I would say go vegetarian. Come off of the meat for some for some time. Okay. You know, and make sure you're well, you know, rehydrated. You know, you're well hydrated. Exercise helps too. Of eh? course, of course. Diet and exercise, you can't go wrong there. All right. All right. There is a point that I would like to, to bring to the attention of the public. Um... The Georgetown Post Public Hospital had an exercise. Yes. They went around to the different wards and the different um, clinics and so on just to see how persons are washing their hands. Mm -hmm. And they found that 95% of the persons there were not doing it properly. Meaning as, as in medical personnel? As in medical personnel. 95%. Either Isn't not enough, either they're not using the right um, solution, or, or they're not doing it at all, or, or that's it. And this is this is this was last week. But isn't there something? basic that you learn in medical school or wherever you go to further your studies before you even become a doctor. The point is how basic is basic. Mm -hmm. ah. When you think that you might be doing the basic thing, you might be doing it wrong. Mm -hmm. And that is why, you know. I, I said it before and I'm going to repeat it because I would be repeating it for emphasis. If as a healthcare worker you are supposed to protect yourself first but the means of protections are not there then you have nobody but yourself to be blamed. Nobody but yourself to be blamed. And, and I say it to the student nurses, to the, the medical students, to everybody. If you've got to wear a mask because somebody's sneezing in your presence, then you should, you should wear it. If you've got to wear gloves because somebody's bleeding or oozing from some, some, then you should use it. If it's not there, you make the decision. If you're supposed to be gunged up and gunged up properly, I have seen, I've seen persons going into the operating room with putting clothes over the clothes that they came with. That should never happen. I've seen hospitals where you, before you go 
into the actual hospital, the operating part, you had to pass through a shower. It means that you are as naked as you're born on this side and, and, and get a shower before you go on the other side. I'm telling you this so that you can get from one extreme to the other. All right. we, and just to add to what Dr. said, indeed last week was infection control week and accident emer emergency scored poorly. And if that's to be the first that's line where the folks... Accident emergency. That's right. And they scored very poorly because hygiene and everything is in um, the checklist that they were using, they didn't score very well. And so uh, we have to stop being complacent. I think they're really too complacent, you know. Nothing happens, nothing said, as we would normally say. And, we, you know, we're reactive rather than proactive. But I hope that this program will at least, you know, you know, persons will come to their senses, especially healthcare workers also, to realize that it's very important in times like these that we, you know, do necessary um, personal protective equipment. We ensure we dress with the, no the necessary um, equipment so that we can avoid such diseases like Ebola. All right. But, but not to be on the negative side, just mm -hmm. to follow up on what Dr. Cummins said. Um, while accident and emergency, for so many reasons, might have scored poorly, yet our neonatology unit scored high, scored very high, that's our, that's our babies, you know, okay. and congratulations to mm -hmm. them, congratulations to the Camerville Health Center that did well, Ward E, yeah. you know, and uh, I'm saying this because we're not only here to beat the government. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And okay? to show that there's still some yes, hope. Some, exactly, that's right. That's right. you know, and not only that, to mm -hmm. let everybody know that we are here, ready to take over government, to do the proper thing, but to work with who's really ready to work that's with right, us as well. That's right. All right. You know? All right. Um, viewers, uh, I notice the phone lines are quiet, but I'm going to tell you now that they're open. I'm going to try to take at least a, a, a quite a number of calls because we have about eight minutes or so left. Please be brief. Health sector. Health sector. And of course, we're talking Ebola and any other matter uh, that's bothering you in the health sector. Be as brief as you possibly can and turn the volume of your television set down. Caller, welcome. Hi, good morning. Good afternoon. A pleasant day to you and your panel. Yes. And uh, we speak about the Ebola virus. Uh -huh. But they are here, the whole big, big government, they're Ebola, they're sick. So we got to get rid of that virus before anything. Thank you. Carla, thank you very much. I, I, I thank you for the humor, but um, I know other persons have serious questions and serious comments. So let's try to keep it serious today. Carla, are you there? Caller, welcome. Caller? All right, we don't have the time for that. Hello? Caller, welcome. Um, good day, good day, the panel. Good day. Um, at Tamiri, do you have any clinic? Anybody testing you? The borderline? But when you come over to Guyana, when you come to the plane, anything? Caller, not as we uh, know as yet, but we're trusting that uh, not only this program, but a series of programs that we've been having for the past two weeks, we're trusting that these things are going to force the government to get something in place. This is the reason we're having this program, and, and that's the reason I have Dr. Cummins and Dr. Norton uh, telling yes, you about A lot of people come over from the border into Guyana. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah. Brazil, Venezuela, Suriname, all over, a lot of Africa, and everybody's come over. Nobody don't get in test, nobody don't show no passport. Large people in Guyana, thousands of people come from Brazil and Venezuela in Guyana. That's true. I didn't even tell you. I know what's going on. I'll tell you. Okay. And nobody getting checked for a bullet, nothing at all. Indeed. Indeed, caller. Um, thank you very much. We're doing the best that we can. Remember, and I, I, I know some persons like to beat upon the government and ask, uh, like to beat upon the opposition. What is the opposition doing? You're all only talking, but viewers keep in mind we don't have the money we are not the ones in control we can only continue to try to hold the government accountable caller welcome caller are you there yes good evening good day um i'm listening to your program and i'm looking at dr norton and dr Cummins. Uh -huh. um i want two things i have a comment to make and then i have a question to ask go ahead you know the hinterland Region 8 is bounded by Brazil, and rumors go around, whether true or lie, there was a rumor that there was a case of Ebola in Brazil. Mm -hmm. If that is so... No, that is not true. Before you even go further, because I don't want persons to panic and get scared, uh, me, even the CDC, they have reported that the person, it, he's an Ebola-free, the person never had Ebola. It was just a fear and a concern. But okay. go ahead. But 
because of our loose border situation in that area, should anything like that happen, I know it would be real bad and ugly. Mm -hmm. Two, um, I would like to perhaps direct my attention to money spending. I would appreciate if while the government is spending all the money, all the money that they are voting for the Rodney Commission, the Inquiry mm -hmm. Commission about Rodney and Bill. Yeah. I don't have a problem with that, but I would like money to be directed in a very sensible way, like get us prepared for Ebola. Okay. I'll tell you what, my son took a test for taking mm -hmm. and they sent it something from the, to Trinidad. And that is like more than two months ago. And Malika, to date, we haven't got no results. Well, I guess it's negative. But in the case of yet an outbreak, are we prepared to deal with it? Hmm. I could answer the question right to this. Yeah, no. I think we are. But I, would, I am saying this because I really want somebody to hear and they're going to tell the government. Because they got people, they put people for watching this program. Yeah, I we know that. It. Mm -hmm. I want the government to direct the attention in the right way and spend the money meaningful towards our health situation in Guyana. Thank you very much, Kuala. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, I'm sorry. We have to let you go uh, because we are running out of time. And I wanted to at least try to take uh, one other call because I know persons are really concerned. But caller, you're... Oh, boy. Apparently, we missed that one. Caller, are you there? Caller? Yeah, well, like, uh, good day. All right, good, good day. day. You have to be brief for me. You're a final call. Go ahead. Uh, I just want to know, like, how the Ebola got 21 days incubation time? Mm -hmm. Like, if somebody gets sick, mm -hmm. like, walking on the thieves and everything and vomit, now, normally mm -hmm. we get floods in the area steady. Yes. Um, somebody vomiting the, the cutters, we have flood the, the water on the parapet. We walk, we go into GPL, some other place, what will happen with the people them that get contact with the type of mess? It's a very good question, caller, and a, a very question for me to close the phone lines on. Please listen uh, for a response from the doctors off air. Thank you for that, Dr. Norton. Now, um, while it is a fact that uh, it's the body fluid that has the virus. Mm -hmm. um, it is known that it does not live for too long outside of the body fluid. And um, even in, 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 in dead bodies, while it exists there, and that's why we've got to be careful uh, with our manner of, of yes. burying the dead, um, it, it, you know, it still has a certain amount of time in which it can exist. What I would like the public to know is while the doctors through lab tests and so on can clear you of the Ebola virus, in other words, you're free once again, your semen can transmit it for seven weeks after. After being declared free. Ebola free, you can transmit through sexual contact se for seven weeks after and that is important for us to know but not necessarily through sweat, sweat and saliva and no, no. Uh, once you're once, cleared right right, right. Oh. the other thing is we've got to be careful about the so-called alternative medicine we heard on our re uh, television uh, station persons curing aids We've read about it in, in, in different advertisements. I have uh, I listened to an, uh, a, a message on YouTube speaking about um, celluloid silver, how this is so powerful, it's a, so, such a good thing. We've got to be careful about that. Don't let us fall into that trap. On one of our programs, a caller called in to say, that urine is the best cure for everything. So, if, you know, and this is the last nation watch we had. Let us be careful, and this is why it is so important that we get the information from the authorities. We want the Minister of Health to come as regularly as possible on the different media, letting us know 
what is the situation with Ebola? Thank you, Dr. Norton. Unfortunately, we're out of time and we've barely scratched the surface, but I can tell you, AP and you will continue to update you. Um, Dr. Cummins, I'm just going to give you a, a minute or so um, just to remind the nation of how careful we should be and safeguard ourselves, not only because Ebola is out there, but I think we have relaxed too much when it comes to sanitation, when it comes to protecting ourselves. Dr. Cummings. Yes, I agree with you, Malika. We cannot afford at this juncture to be complacent, but we have to be ever watchful, ensure that we are putting on our mask and taking the syrup precaution in terms of our hygiene, uh, we have our sanitizers, we have soap and water. Let's make use of these <laughs> uh, say, uh, that stuff that we have. Um, those in the interior, um, we know a differential diagnosis of uh, Ebola is, ma is malaria. So please, not because you have ma something you may have malaria and you don't know something you actually have Ebola. Okay. So we have to make sure, we hope that before this disease is finished or it does come here, we'll be able to upgrade our lab facilities. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of work to do, and I, my guess as good as yours that we have much, we still have um, monies to be directed to the assistance of this Ebola virus. It's a virulent disease, and we definitely don't want it on our shores. So I'm appealing to the government to make sure they have adequate, they put some priority in terms of putting some money allocating to this um, health sector so that we can able to have necessary equipment, we can be fully prepared for if the disease does reach Guyana. Thank you very much Dr. Karen Cummins. Thank you very much Dr. George Norton. Of course Dr. George Norton is the Shadow Minister of Health. Uh, Dr. Karen Cummins is an APNU Member of Parliament and I'd just like to add and in this case I'm going to talk specifically to the Health Minister Dr. Barry Ramsaran. Stop being so complacent and tell the nation and don't just tell the nation but do. Of course a partnership for national unity has said time and time again that it's willing to sit to be a part of whatever national plan you're going to have of course providing that the monies that will be provided for such a, a, a national plan would not be misused or misspent because this is not about APNU and PNC and PPP this is about everyone if Ebola comes here it wouldn't de decide whether you're PPP or whether you're your your opposition or whether you're uh, whether you're APNU or whether you're AFC it can attack anyone at any time so Dr. Barry Ramsaran please we're pleading with you do something this has been facing the nation I am Alika Ramsey thank you very much for watching and of course do join me again next week be good guy citizens take care of yourselves and each other bye bye